worshiping the Lord. He's so, so good. He's so deserving of all of our worship. So let's keep at it. <laughs> Yeah. 
speech of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. For in everything he is preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of of his cross. Jesus, you are preeminent in all things. You are above all things. You are before all things. You are over all things. We come to worship you this morning because you are our Lord, our Saviour. And yet you are willing to come and die on the cross to, to reconcile the world to yourself pay the price for our sin. You have called us as your church to be reconcilers in this world. Lord, as we look around our world, we look around our country, we see it in tatters right now. We see great division and hurt and anger and all kinds of things going on. And we know what the answer is. You. There is no other answer for you. If, if we want to be reconciled to be one another, we need to be reconciled to you. So help us as your church, as your people, Lord, to be reconciled. We pray for salvation this week. That's the business that you're in, that's the business that we are in as your church. The cost was great for you. You paid with your body, you paid with your blood to reconcile us to you. We thank you, we praise you, Jesus, that you were willing to make that sacrifice and that you are preeminent. worship you, we praise you, we glorify you through your most holy and majestic and wonderful name. For God's people so. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. How are we this morning? All right. All right. All right. Good to see you here this morning. If you have a Bible with you, open it to Luke chapter nine. You'll be relieved that we are going back to our series in Luke and not continuing on in Judges. So, <laughs> yeah. so happy for me. Although I think it was uh, important that we did that last week, and uh, yeah. let's not forget about it as we move on. Anyway, we are in Luke chapter 9. If you don't have a Bible with you, you can find that in page 814 in a Bible and the chair in, in front of you. How many of you drive a car? Mm -hmm. Oh, you just don't a car? <laughs> Sounds like a trick question. Yeah. <laughs> how, how many of you know how to ride a bike, a push bike, that is? Push bike? Push bike. Yeah, push bike. What's a push bike? As opposed to a mother bike. <laughs> Translation? Yeah. <laughs> not speaking English or what? I'm going to see her after a flying start. Are you talking about a scooter? No. <laughs> <laughs> talking about a pedal bike. Oh. Pedal bike. Uh, uh, 
<laughs> Most of us started off on the push bike, right? You remember that as a little kid when you learned how to ride the push bike? Uh, and you had uh, the, the uh, stabilizers, right? And because, um, you know, it made it into more of a trike than the bike. And um, made it safe, too. Well, more or less safe, unless you went around the corner, corner really too hard, right? And then you could flip it over. But, but the idea was not to keep it as a trike, right? It was to learn how to balance, because those, those stabilizer wheels on the side, you know, they're a little bit short, aren't they? So, you, you know, you can learn how to balance, and they're just there to stop you from going all the way over. And, and then as you get on a little bit, um, and your mum and dad see, you know, that you're making the progress, right? That they say, all right, time to take those wheels off now. And you go, oh! No, 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 I'm not really glad. Yeah, oh, yeah, you are. And, and, and so they come off, and it's really scary, doesn't it? You know, you get on the bike, and but mum or dad is there behind you, they have the, the, the hand on the saddle or on your back, you know, and, and they act as your stabilizer. But then, you know, as you get more proficient at balancing, what you don't realise that mum and dad, you know, kind of take their hand away, don't you? Because mums and dads, you, you've done it too, right? You take your hand away, but you don't tell the child that you're taking your hand away. You make them think that you still have your hand on them, and, and then you say, actually, I can have my hand on you. They go, no, no, no. <laughs> and eventually they realise you have taken your hand away, and then they're off, right? And you get the confidence to go off on your own. And it's kind of that exhilaration and fear, isn't it? And it's kind of the same way when you learn to drive a car, you know, you have the instructor and then you, you gain your proficiency and then you pass your test. And that moment, the first time you drive a car and you're by yourself. You remember that? The first time you ever did that? It's like, wow. On the one hand, it's exhilarating. It's like, Freedom, yeah, this is great. Uh, on the other hand, it's kind of scary because, like, what's something going wrong? And there's no way to hold my hand and tell me what to do. With learning, that's generally a kind of an approach, isn't it? We kind of do like uh, I do, uh, and you watch, uh, and then I do, and you help, right? Uh, and then you do, and I help, and you do, and I watch, and then. Bye-bye, <laughs> off you go, right? But sometimes it's, um, we get chucked into the deep end, don't we? And maybe we get handed a set of keys, to, well, go and move that for me, Brian, and, well, I've never done this before, right? And it's like sink or swim time, and, uh, and sometimes we can learn that way too. Or maybe it's a combination of, of, the bo of both. Which one do you think God used? Or maybe a different question, which one would you like to use on you? <laughs> maybe, maybe that's more of an appropriate question. And, and, and do you think he takes his hand away from you so that you can just go it alone? Well, this morning we're going to look at a passage where Jesus seems to uh, take the train wheels away from the disciples and uh, kind of mixed results, I suppose. Uh, and how do they get on? Are they ready to go it alone? Well, let's find out. Shall we? Luke chapter 9, as I said, verse uh, 1 through 17. And he called to the twelve and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. And he said to them, Take nothing for your journey, nor staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics. But whatever house you enter, say, uh, stay there, and from there depart. Uh, and wherever they uh, do, not do not receive you, when you leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. And they departed and went through the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everyone. Now Herod the Tetrarch heard about all that was happening, and he was perplexed, because it was said by some that John had been raised from the dead, 
by some that Elijah had appeared, and by others that one of the prophets of old had risen. He said, John, I beheaded, but who is this about whom I hear such things? And he sought to see him. On their return, the apostles told him all that they had done. And he took them and withdrew apart to a town called Bethsaida. And when the crowds learned it, they followed him and he welcomed them and spoke to them of the kingdom of God and cured those who had need of healing. Now the day began to wear away. And the twelve came and said to him, send, away the, send the crowd away to go into the surrounding villages and countryside to find and get provisions. For we are here in a desolate place. But he said to them, you give them something to eat. They said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish. Unless we go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. And he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. And they did so and had them all sit down and taking the five loaves and the two fish he looked up to heaven and said a blessing over them then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to sit before the crowd and they all ate and were satisfied and what was left over was picked up 12 baskets of broken pieces One of my uh, fondest learning experiences was when I was about 11 or 12, <clears throat> and uh, from school we learned how to sail. And uh, about a dozen of us uh, were lucky enough to get on this sailing uh, program, whatever it was, course. And basically what it was, there was an estuary nearby and uh, we would go out on a weekend and uh, there was a chap there who uh, taught us, and I use that word loosely, taught us to sell. Uh, and his name was Major Gregson. And uh, not much phased uh, Major Gregson because he'd been in the army and he had fought through the whole of World War II from the uh, deserts of Africa right up through Italy. In fact, he'd been taken uh, prisoner of war and had escaped from a camp underneath the under, under, uh, hiding under a lorry, so uh, he kind of seen it all and done it all and 12 kids in the sailing boat uh, wasn't exactly going to bother him too much. Uh, and his idea of instruction was to show us how to hoist the sails on, on, uh, <laughs> on these dinghies on the beach and uh, give us some brief uh, instruction about how to and uh, two kids to a boat and off we went. <laughs> <laughs> and it was great, you know. It was, it was great fun, we had some dodgy moments, but we all survived. And he had this old motorboat that he would sort of chug around long behind, he couldn't keep up with us, but he was there to fish us out if we got into any trouble. And surprisingly enough, when trouble did happen, suddenly he appeared out of nowhere, right? And uh, even though we thought we were just left to ourselves, he, he was always a constant presence. And, and then we would meet up at some point and uh, you know, park up on a beach and he would produce a thermos of tea and uh, some sandy sandwiches and it was all great. It was a great experience. And we learned. I don't suppose that's quite the way it's done these days, but, you know, again, we all survive. We start this chapter and Jesus is sending out his disciples on their first mission by themselves. And you think, well, fair enough, right? That's why Jesus called them, right? That, that's why he invited them to come along. That was his plan all the way along. You remember back in chapter 7 that Jesus had spent the whole night praying and he had a big crowd of disciples and, and, and he chose these 12 men that he called apostles, which means sent. I think we talked about it before. The idea is actually a vessel being filled <coughs> and then sent out. It's kind of a, a, a good image of that. But, but what are they going to do? Where are they going to go? How are they going to do it? Are, are they even ready to go? How long do you think it takes for someone to be ready to be Jesus' disciple? To be sent out? What's the best way for that to happen? Is that the gradual process or is that the sink and swim kind of process? How 
concentrate us to be saved. I want to remind you the last time that we heard in, in Luke's Gospel from Jesus' disciples. And that was when they were in a boat. And they were in a storm. Remember that? And there they were, these seasoned uh, fishermen, sailors, whatever. Uh, and they're in this storm, and Jesus was asleep in their boat. And what did they do? They were frightened. They were terrified. And, and they woke Jesus. So, like, we're, we're perishing. We're, we're going under Jesus. And, and Jesus rebuked the wind and the waves, remember, and stilled the storm, and, and then asked them a question. Where's your faith? Not that they didn't have any faith, just where did faith? And what if they were uh, marveled that the wind and the waves obeyed Jesus and, and they were afraid? That's the last time that we've heard from these men. Do you think they're ready to be sent out on Jesus' mission? <coughs> that response? Would you sign their certificate? Yep, there you go. Off you go. You're ready to go out by yourself now. Now, you can trust that, right? Because on that story, remember when they got to the other side of the lake, they met this demon possessed man? And Jesus did what? He sent him out. And that bloke had only known him a few hours. He, didn't, he wasn't even a Jew, he didn't even know all the history. And yet Jesus, I mean, talk about sink or swim, right? So you've got on the one hand these disciples that have been with him and their Jewish background and all of that. And then on the other hand, you've got this, this Gentile who, who barely knows Jesus for a couple of hours and then he sends him out, the first mission. Which one would you like to do? Because sometimes I think we feel like we're in the same boat, don't we? Like the disciples. In fact, worse, because the disciples had the privilege of seeing Jesus do all these miraculous things. But we only get to read about Jesus doing all those things. So they actually saw Jesus doing those things. And we think, well, you want me to do what? And go where? <laughs> and, and say what? And it's not because we, we don't have faith, because we do have faith, and, and we believe in Jesus, and, and we trust in Jesus, but then sometimes we hit storms, and sometimes we have some dodgy moments, right? And, and we kind of waver, and we kind of wobble, and, oh, and we feel like we're alone. But are we actually alone? And how much training do we need before we're willing to go? Well, maybe just a little bit more. <laughs> well, how much more? I don't know, but it's a little bit, right? And I'll know it when, it's, when I'm ready, right? But will we? Because we know that we're supposed to be his representatives. We, we know that we're supposed to, to, to go out and talk to our family and our friends and our neighbours and community, country, world even. So, about Jesus. But we look around and what we don't have, and we go. And that's kind of what I want to talk about for the rest of this morning is scarcity. When we just think that there isn't enough, right? Do we see it as an obstacle or an opportunity? You know, when we, when we see a, a glass like it's, uh, it's half full, right? It, it, but it's the same quantity of liquid in the glass. That doesn't change, does it? But it's our perspective of whether we see it as, a, a, as an obstacle, or it's only half full, or we see it as an opportunity. Oh, that room's full of water. Let's jump in there. And start with Jesus, because first of all, he called. He calls together the, the twelve in this passage, and not to name them, but to give them instructions. I suppose it was in my uh, early twenties or so, uh, a mate and I, my, myself, we thought it would be a good idea, and uh, relived childhood, and we bought a sailing dinghy, right? 
And uh, we took it down to a little estuary and we um, we're going to give it a go. And my mate goes, oh, it's a bit windy, isn't it, Ron? And I said, no, no, don't worry. I've done all this many times before. I'm an expert, right? So, yeah, what could possibly go wrong? So we jumped in the, in the dinghy and we pushed out, except it was a lot windier out on the uh, river than it was where we put the sails up. And, of course, the wind caught the sails. And we actually belted across this estuary. Uh, and we were struggling to keep the boat up and everything. And uh, we, we kind of had the kind of had it under control, but then of course you get to the other side and you've got to do something, right? Because you're going to pile into the rocks on the other side. And I was like, oh, I can't remember which way to turn. Do you turn into the wind or you turn away from the wind? And uh, made the fatal mistake of turning away from the wind, which is in the same terms is called driving. And what happens is the wind catches the sail and it goes, BAM! Right across, and the whole boat goes, and we were climbing up the sides trying to keep it upright. Uh, I don't know how we kept it you know, from going under, but we did, and we shot back across to where we came from, and right, that's enough of that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we got that sailing, and uh, we retired back um, from the scene of the fray. And I learned something that day that uh, maybe I was not the sailor that I thought I was. And the next time I went out, I was a lot more cautious and, 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 and a lot more. And I think about the time when the, the disciples, especially like Peter and Andrew and James and John, when they received the call to follow Jesus. You know, they, they were fishing, right? In fact, they'd been out fishing all night long. And they caught zero. <laughs> and Jesus comes along the next day uh, and he uses their boat as a, as a kind of a floating pulpit, doesn't he? Uh, and then when he's done teaching, he asks um, them to, to push out and, and go fishing. And it's like the middle of the day, and they go, oh, no, no, Jesus is sick. But nonetheless, they, they follow Jesus, and they go out, and they put their nets over, uh, and they literally get a boatload of fish. And, and Peter does what he, he recognizes that Jesus is more than just a good fisherman. He, he recognizes that there's something extraordinary about Jesus. And, and, and he gets on his face before Jesus and says, Depart from me from my own sinful man. And Jesus told him not to worry because from now on he would be catching people, not fish. And that was a turning point for them because they'd be kind of been following Jesus up until that point, but now they were 24 7 Jesus' disciples. And that's the place where we receive the call for Jesus. Isn't it? When we recognize the scarcity in our own lives, where we recognize the, the barrenness in our own lives, that we can't do anything for God in our own power, in our own strength, in our own expertise. We, we can't do anything for God. If we think Jesus is calling us because, well, he's such a good sailor, I need him to have him, and, and, and she's so good at this, and he's so good at that, you know, I, I possibly can't do my ministry without bringing them all on board, then, you know, we're the world is saving, aren't we? That's not to say that Jesus doesn't use those gifts and abilities and skills and talents that we have, right? Because he, he certainly does use them. But that's not why he's calling <coughs> us. He's not calling me because I'm an expert sailor. Not that I'm an expert sailor, as you've already averted from it. <laughs> but that's where it starts. Because if we don't recognize the scarcity in ourselves, then we won't hear Jesus. We won't hear his call. Think of Moses. Now, he was born a Hebrew slave. We, we all kind of know the story. And, um, you know, his mum hid him in the, <coughs> by the banks of the Nile in that basket. And he was found by Pharaoh's daughter. And um, grew up in Pharaoh's house, didn't he? And no doubt he, he became an expert of all kinds of things and was, had, had this power and prestige. Uh, and yet God's call obviously was on his life. But 
But he didn't hear God's call at that time, did he? Because he went out uh, and he saw this uh, Egyptian beating up a Hebrew. He, he knew where his roots were. Uh, and he went to intervene, didn't he? And what did he do? He ended up murdering the Egyptian. And he buried the, the Egyptian in the sand. Uh, and he thought that he got away with it. You know, there was no CSI back then or anything like that. <laughs> and uh, except he forgot one crucial fact is that, that the, the Hebrew, of course, had seen him do it. And the next day he saw two Hebrews arguing and fighting amongst themselves. And he went to intervene. And, uh, and one of them said, who made you, boss? What are you going to do? Kill me like you did that Egyptian? And of course his secret was out. And he had to do a runner. And it was 40 years, wasn't it? Before he recognized God's call. 40 years of what? Scarcity of God carrying him back down to size, I think. In fact, so much uh, did Moses have scarcity in view that when God called him, that, that then became an obstacle, didn't it? Well, I can't go, God, because I can't. But until we recognize the scarcity in our own lives and, and the need for God's grace, for his forgiveness, for his love, for his truth, chances are we'll miss God's call. We won't hear. But when we throw ourselves at the foot of the cross, and when we plead for forgiveness, and when we're filled with his grace and his mercy, and then we can rejoice with the psalmist. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. So do you see that scarcity in your life is an opportunity for God's call? Secondly, Jesus is power. He gives his disciples what power and, and authority. And yet, on the other hand, he tells them, right, that when he sent them out on this mission, that they can't take anything but the bare necessities. No, I'm not going to burst into song. <laughs> <laughs> One thing uh, about sailing is it's not like um, driving a motorbike, right? You drive a, a boat with an engine in it, you know, you want to go faster, you push the throttle forward, don't you? You want to go slower, you pull the throttle back. You, you want to go to the right, I should probably use the uh, nautical uh, starboard, right? Uh, you turn the wheel to the starboard. You want to go to the port, you turn the port wheel to port. And it's pretty it's simple, right? You, you don't have to do too much else or worry about too much else about where your power is coming from unless your engine uh, breaks down or you run out of petrol. But sailing doesn't work like that. It all depends on what the wind. And it all depends on the strength of the wind and where the wind is coming from. Because if you want to get from point A to point B, it depends. How, where the wind's coming from. It's coming from behind you. you, you just put the sails out and that's great, you just If it's coming from the side, that's not too bad either. But if it's coming from head on and you want to get there, then you have to kind of tap, right? And your um, speed and direction will depend on, on keeping those sails full. And there is a couple of different things you can do. You can, you know, depending on how close the wind you sail, uh, um, will depend on how fast you, you can go, how much power you extract from the wind, if you like. Because the boat is most empowered when, when the sail is optimally filled. And I kind of have this image of. Um, being sent out by Jesus in a, in a sailing boat. And we kind of thrown the motor, if you like, overboard. 
and that's kind of what the disciples were. They, they'd thrown their own power, they'd thrown their own means of propulsion overboard, and now they were, they were sailing under the power of, of God. Not the wind, but under the power of the Holy Spirit. Because that Holy Spirit is an unseen force, isn't it? Sometimes we need to be careful here, though, because he's not like some um, impersonal force like in Star Wars or something. That would be heresy. He's not even a lesser person than God. So often he is betrayed that way. That also would be heresy. He is fully God, part of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, equal, different person. One God, different roles. You get that bit in this passage that we read where Herod is, is pondering about who Jesus is, right? We get the shocking news here in Luke. In fact, Luke doesn't tell us the story about John, that John is dead. And, and, and uh, Herod has had John beheaded. So he's thinking, he's heard these rumors about who Jesus is. And he goes, well, he's not John. I don't know what happened to him. I chopped his head off. And Elijah, or one of the other prophets, I don't know, it sounds kind of unlikely, but I kind of want to find out who, who this Jesus is. But what Herod failed to recognize was that the, the, the power behind everything is the Holy Spirit, is the power of God. It's that unseen, immovable force that pushes the story of God's redemptive story forward, isn't it? He's the wind in the sails, if you like, of God's narrative of redemption. The twists and the turns. You know, in the Bible, you know, sometimes, right, like the wind, you know, it's like, it, it, it kind of seems like God takes a circuitous route to get somewhere, doesn't he? <laughs> and then sometimes it goes really fast, doesn't it, the story? It's like just a, a big gale is blowing and everyone's just hanging on for dear life, trying to keep the path up line. And then sometimes it seems like the wind just dies. And the story has just become for days, months, years. Until the wind picks up and starts to move the story forward again. And of course, in Hebrew, the, the Hebrew word for wind is rock, and that means spirit and breath. And you read in the very opening of Genesis there that, that what the Spirit of God was holding over the face of the waters. The Holy Spirit was there right at the very beginning. And he's rare. <laughs> there all the way through the Bible until its conclusion. In fact, Jesus, right, when he left, before he left, uh, went to the cross, he told his disciples that he would not, not leave them alone. He would not leave them as orphans. If they thought like he was their stabilizer, right, and, oh my gosh, Jesus is going away, but I'm not leaving you alone. He had empowered them for the ministry to which he had called them. And the Holy Spirit's here this morning. The same Spirit who hovered over the face of the horse. The same Spirit that Jesus empowered to send out his disciples in. The same Spirit who rose Jesus from the dead. That power is here. This morning. He is with us this morning. That's Jesus' promise. He came into our lives when we received Christ. And our job then is to steer a course which catches his power and kills ourselves. Because what stops us? From being empowered by the Spirit of God. What stops us being empowered by the Holy Spirit? Sometimes you see yachts, right? They have sails, but they have engines. <laughs> and sometimes I see yachts that um, 
hardly ever put up their cells. They've got them, ostensibly they are, they are a sailing boat, right? But they seem to rely on their engines more than their sails. And sometimes we do that too. I think that's what happened with the disciples when they went out on their first missionary trip. Jesus said, no, you're just taking the bare essentials, nothing else. And they had nothing else to rely on except the power of the Holy Spirit. They had to, to look to the Spirit for everything that they did, for it to meet all their needs, for their direction, for everything. And, and what happened? Big. <coughs> that, that what they did, their ministry reflected that, didn't they? They, they were empowered by the Spirit. And then we get to the second part of the story, where this crowd has gone out to hear Jesus. Yeah, and, you know, the, 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 the time is getting late, the, the evening's coming, and the disciples are, are looking around and looking at their watches. And, oh, Jesus, it's going on a bit tonight, isn't he? <laughs> Don't know what they're going to do. You know, these people are in fair play. At least they have some concern for the crowd's well-being, I suppose, right? But then they go to Jesus, Jesus and, and, and in the Greek, it's an imperative. They command Jesus <laughs> to send the people away. Jesus, you have to send the crowd away. Can you imagine that? You have to send the crowd away. What happened to their empowerment by the Spirit? They got back to using their own engines, didn't they? They, they looked at the scarcity and they thought... That's an obstacle. That's not an opportunity. That's an obstacle. And how often do we do that? When we look at scarcity, we go, and we look at it in our own power, what we can do with what we have, and we go, yeah, that's not true. It's kind of a, a paradigm, a mindset that we get ourselves into. The people of uh, the Hebrews, when God brought them out of Egypt on the, on the Exodus, they had that mindset. That's what they were used to, right? They were, they were slaves. They weren't used to being empowered by God. They had that scarcity paradigm, and scarcity was always an obstacle. Even though they had seen the, the, the Spirit of God, they'd seen the wind of, of God separate the, the waters of the Red Sea so they could walk through on try and and yet they got to the other side into the wilderness and they, no food here, scarcity, problem, obstacle, we should turn around and go back. <laughs> but God had a different answer, didn't he? It says that as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked towards the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumblings of the people of Israel. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. So are you empowered this morning by the Holy Spirit? Or are your sails, metaphorically speaking, filled with his presence? So Jesus calls, he empowers, and then lastly, he sends. He sends the disciples out, healing, preaching, teaching, and they follow uh, Jesus' instructions and they see the power of God. Often my, my, the little experience my mate and I had with our first saving trip, <laughs> it would be really easy just to leave the dinghy in the garage, frankly. You know, it's like, all right, been there, done that, tried that. That looks, that looks risky and frightening, and uh, we'll just leave it there, right? But uh, saying boats aren't uh, built to be left in garages, are they? They're, they're built to be put on water, they're built to be sailed. Last year, um, we set sail, we thought, <laughs> for, uh, to build, um, to plant a, a church in, in North Redmond. And uh, we kind of thought, 
Well, we know how we were going to get there. Uh, as it turns out, things didn't go quite the way we, we thought they were going to go. And of course, it seems like a long time ago now, doesn't it? Because so much has happened since then, and here we are, you know, uh, COVID, post COVID. Oh, post COVID? No, I suppose we're not post COVID. Yeah. I don't know what the term is for that now anymore. And, you know, we see the division in the country, and it's like, wow. Wow. And when we set sail last year for the North Redmond plant, we, we really felt like we were steering with the wind, and I believe that we were steering, steering with the Holy Spirit, that we were uh, under his guidance. And let's face it, good things have, have come. You know, we had the after school program, although mm -hmm. now we feel becalmed with all that too, right? With where we are today. And it would be really easy for us to retreat and, and put it all back in the garage and go, well, we tried that, <laughs> and uh, that didn't go quite how we thought it was going to go, so uh, let's just uh, stay indoors and um, be safe. And it'd be easy for us to focus on the scarcity that we see going on right now uh, and see that just as an obstacle. Well, you know, that didn't work, got COVID-19 and we've got all this division going on in the country and, and where's it all going to land and maybe we should just wait and, and, and see what's going to happen. I think the Holy Spirit doesn't always lead, as I said, in a straight line, right? It, it, it's kind of like sailing. I mean, I look at the Apostle Paul's journey and it's right? He, he wants to go here like he wants to go to Rome and uh, well, eventually he gets to Rome, doesn't he? But not the way he thought he was going to get to Rome, and not in the time, and not going to how he thought it was going to work out. We still have the same vision that we had. We still want to be a church planting church. That's our vision, right? We believe that. We want to be a smaller church planting smaller churches. And you know, we've definitely learned a few things over the last year or so. We've learned some things over the last couple of months, frankly, you know. Uh, live streaming. And I do apologize for live streaming. Uh, we, I do know what the, one of the issues is with, with why uh, the thing jumps, so we will fix that. Um, and we're working on it. we also done some Zoom groups and stuff, and, uh, you know, I think there's possibility to do more of that kind of thing. And the live streaming will continue. As, as we keep saying. Uh, and so we've learned some stuff, right? We, we, we've added some stuff uh, through this process. And again, that hasn't changed the vision. And I think one thing we also learned uh, last year is that maybe we didn't have quite the critical mass to, to do a, a church plant as well. We maybe need to be a, a little bit bigger as a church. But that presents a problem, right? Because I know <laughs> we're a little bit empty here this morning, but before COVID-19, we were full. We were at maximum capacity. <coughs> so how do we reach a more of a critical mass when we're at maximum capacity? Well, I guess we could do a couple of services. That would be one option. But that's not really kind of our vision of, of being a smaller church, planting a smaller church. It's so that we can all be one community. When you start having two different services, you know, it's, it's, it's more difficult to keep that. So as the shepherds and myself have uh, been praying about it and, and, and where the Spirit is leading and the options available to us, um, we kind of thought, well, what if we kind of reconfigured this building? Maybe we could make space. Or, or what are the opportunities with this building? And so we have uh, hired an architect, and uh, they are working right now um, and uh, to come up with options, right? Opportunities. Because we can see this as an obstacle. OK, that's all we can do. That's as big as we can get, or, or, or we can see it as an opportunity right now. Because 
I look around and see what's going on, you know, in, in our community, in our country, in the world, and I see an opportunity. I see how desperately people need Jesus. I, I just there are so many inroads there, and it would be easy again for us just to look at the scarcity of the situation right now and go, well, maybe we shouldn't do anything. But we perfectly feel that we should be doing something. The first thing to do is to see what God wants us to do. And I think it fits in here, right? Because, you know, Jesus does what? He, he, he takes the, the loaves and the fish, which the disciples thought, what's that? You know, five loaves, a couple of fish, 5,000 people. And yet Jesus took them and he gave thanks and he blessed them and he broke the bread and he multiplied it to feed them all. And did they just get a taste? No. They were filled. They were stuffed. And more than that, it's just a little object lesson for his disciples. How many baskets did they get to pick up? Well, one each, right? Just a little bit of an object lesson there for them. And so I think what we feel that we're doing is that we're, we're taking uh, the five loaves and fish, if you like, that the, 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 the church has, uh, and we're just offering it to the Lord uh, and seeing how He might bless it uh, and use it and multiply it. His glory in his kingdom. And we have a lot to offer, you know. This building is a good building. And uh, you know, I have to say, I'm so humbled by this church. You've been so generous. I mean, all the, the weeks that we didn't meet, uh, the offerings that have continued to, to more than meet the budget. And we are so blessed. And we are so humbled by that. To invite Jesus into our scarcity, I guess that's what we, what we want to do. Because when we do that, Jesus will open our eyes. One of my favorite stories of the resurrection is when those two disciples, they're heading out of Jerusalem. Heading off to Emmaus. You know, they thought it was over and finished. Uh, and Jesus meets them on the road, right? And uh, gets into conversation with them and they, they kind of explain what's going on. And uh, you know, that's that whole lovely bit. You know, Are you the only person in Jerusalem who doesn't know what's going on? Kind of thing. It's like, no, it's the one person that does know what's going on. And uh, as they walk down on the road to Emmaus, you know, Jesus opens the scriptures up before them. And then they get to a mass and they invite him in. Uh, and what happens? Jesus breaks the bread. And they see who he is. And even though it's late in the day and they should have just stayed there for the evening, what do they do when Jesus disappears? They hightail it as fast as they can back to Jerusalem to tell everyone else the news that Jesus is resurrected. Jesus changes scarcity into opportunity, doesn't he? And it sends us out, rushing out to tell people the good news. So how do you see scarcity this morning? Do you see it as an obstacle? Or do you see it as an opportunity? We're called to be Jesus' disciples because... We've seen the scarcity in our own lives. And when that happens, and we receive him as our Lord and Saviour, he doesn't just leave us alone, he, he then empowers us with his Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is what must drive us. And then he sends us out. Because there's a hurting world out there who needs the good news of Jesus. 
What's God saying to us this morning? Well, let's uh, pray and then we'll finish the service. <laughs> Father, first of all, uh, thank you and praise you for sending your Son into this world. And I thank you and praise you, Lord, that I am so blessed to be part of this church. With, with brothers and sisters who have their sails filled with your spirit, filled with your spirit of generosity, who have heard your call, who have recognized the scarcity in their own lives and, and come to the foot of the cross and ask you to fill them. And you call us, Jesus, to be your disciples. Not because of what we can offer you, but because of what you've done for us. And you don't leave us alone, but you fill us with your power. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're here today to empower us with the mission that you've called us to. Help us uh, steer a course that keeps our sails filled with you. Don't let us turn back to our own power, but adjust our course and trim our sails to, to be empowered by you. And guide us and lead us, Lord, as your church, to see the opportunities that you're sending us out to. We don't know where those opportunities lie specifically, but you do. And so, Lord, as we do this feasibility study and, and we look to see the direction that you will have us go, because you, we know, that, Lord, that you want us to be a church planting church. That's a biblical thing. And reach people for you. And so we humbly come before you, Lord, and we offer our, our loaves and fish to you. You would multiply them to feed the crowd around us with the good news. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a brief reminder, remember, that we, will not, we don't pass the offering plates right now. So there's a box sitting out there in the foyer, and uh, if you want to drop it. An offering in there, that would be the place to do that afterwards. <laughs>